All right, good evening everyone. My name is Alain Ibrahim and I, tonight I am presenting a section on Ajax and uh, walkthrough for project two. Uh, the first thing I would like to uh, ask you is, what is Ajax? Uh, after David's lecture, does, can anyone uh, define what Ajax is? Or tell me succinctly what, what it would mean when we say Ajax. Okay, Ajax, I will, I will tell you what, the, what Ajax stands for. Ajax stands for Asynchronous JavaScript and XML. Uh, I'm not going to go into the why it, it mentions XML now, but uh, at the time of inception, XML was mostly popular as opposed to, as opposed to JSON uh, as a format of uh, data uh, interchange and so forth. Uh, the, main, the crux of Ajax is actually JavaScript. Uh, let me move on to the next slide. So here we go. All right. So. Ajax is really a combination of existing technologies, uh, one being HTML. Although HTML is not the uh, functional component, component of Ajax, it is the representation layer. So essentially, if you have uh, your JavaScript, XML, and so, or JSON, and so forth, and you're making a call of some sort, it's kind of uh, maybe useless if you're not going to present it in some visual fashion. Hence the, the need for, uh, hence the presence of HTML in my definition of Ajax. Uh, you do need JavaScript because uh, Ajax relies on an object, a JavaScript, say, class called XML HTTP request. And this object acts as a liaison between the client side and the server side, passing data back and forth in the background. Before Ajax, uh, we used to have pages like client browsers make requests to the, to, the br to the server side. And what would essentially happen is the server would output um, some text or some HTML, and the entire page on the client side would be reloaded. With, uh, with Ajax, uh, with, with the inception of Ajax, uh, what happens now is the the requests are sent in the background and they are responded also in the background while the remain, remainder of the client side script is still working. And once the client side uh, script receives the response from the server, it can then interpret it and apply it accordingly to the document object model or it can do something else with it, for example. Uh, in the acronym, of Ajax, there's the asynchronous word, and I will stress a little more on that, what it means. Uh, Ajax is asynchronous in the fact that when a request is sent to the server, the remainder of your client-side code, your JavaScript code, can be executed uh, and, or, and, and not stopped before the, res the server has responded back to you. So when, it, let's suppose you have a function that calls uh, asks for, like in David's example, asks for a quote, and your web page does other things other than uh, lists your, other than show you the quote. Your client side page will do the other things, and the servers, meanwhile, the, the server is working in the background over the internet, and once it has responded, your page can then take that response and interpret it. Now, uh, Ajax is not always asynchronous. Ajax can also be synchronous. Uh, there's a little setting you can toggle in your function. Uh, and, and that uh, you can make Ajax synchronous such that it will not continue executing the rest of your JavaScript code until it has received a response back from the server. And I, I will show you this briefly. Okay, I'm not going there yet. So now I will demonstrate an example, uh, some source code, where I dive in a little deeper into the inner workings of Ajax. Okay, so what I have done here on this side is I created two files, just two files. I do understand that David shows you different iterations of the uh, examples and so forth as they build up. 
but I'm uh, going to simplify it uh, and the actual different features are all embedded in both of these files. So there's a, I have an ajax.html page and an ajax.php page. The, the, the ajax.html page corresponds to the client side of ajax and the ajax.php page is the, the actual server side script that, the, that is being uh, uh, called uh, from the client side. I will first uh, open up ajax.html. It is a typical HTML uh, document, HTML5 document, as specified here. In the head tag, I uh, make a call to receive the jQuery library from Google. So um, this first uh, script tag references the jQuery library from Google. This has nothing to do with Ajax right now, but I will be using it later to apply the methods like that, uh, such as dot Ajax that David had mentioned in class. And uh, let's see what else. The next set of script tags will define what I um, created for, for this uh, example. Okay, so for a complete Ajax turnaround, what do we really need to do? There are, in my opinion, there are three main things that need to be done. Uh, underneath the hood, you need to first create an XML HTTP request object. That is the first step. The second step is to utilize this XML HTTP request object to send data to the server and receive data back from the server, uh, so, uh, which, takes, which takes us to step number three, which is the response function there will be a callback function that takes the data that is being sent by the server back to the client and, handles, uh, and that handles the data accordingly, according to your code or your design, design decisions. Uh, now moving to the code, I, uh, the first step here for me, first step that I have done is I have created a variable called XHR which will uh, host, I, or which will be the placeholder for the XML HTTP request object. I have set it to null and I have defined it specifically outside of the functions so that all the functions can have access to it once we have created a new XML HTTP request object. And the second step is that um, I created a function called create HTTP request that would return an actual, an actual XML HTTP request object. David had uh, mentioned this in class, so I will not uh, repeat or I will not dive into this again. But basically, the basic idea here is that you are creating an XML HTTP request object, object through this function. And it, that's what, that is what this function is returning. And now I, will, I created my own function called getText, which will just basically get text from uh, the server side which, it, or in this case, ajax.php. So in this function, uh, I define a few things. First thing I'll define is uh, a, a variable called params, where I insert, where I define what parameters I will send to the server along with their values. In this case, I will, I'm defining a variable called I want text and I have set the value of this to yes. This is really nothing meaningful, but it's just uh, an example. Uh, this works in also in the same way that you would normally um, do in, uh, uh, when, you, when you send requests via URL and you put the ampersand sign. So if I want to send more than one variable here, I would put uh, ampersand and say variable two equals to five, for example. And when I send these, uh, and this will allow me to send the variables over to the server. I mean, not this alone, but this is the structure of how uh, they are laid out. Next is, uh, I'll define a, val a variable called URL, which points to the server side script. In this case, it is called ajax.php. It could have been something like http colon slash slash 
some it could have been script over the network over the internet somewhere but in this case for simplicity uh, sake I have used uh, it's, it's in the same folder structure and it's called ajax.php the next remaining <coughs> few lines pertain to the actual XHR object, which in this case is the XML HTTP request object. So the, the remainder of these lines in this function are all AJAX, or in how AJAX works. All right, so the first thing I do here is I give the value of XHR, uh, I create an HTTP request object, which returns an XML HTTP request object. And uh, I will give that value to the variable XHR. The next thing, uh, which is what David mentioned in class, is I will create a connection to the server side script uh, by calling the open method. So I'll do XHR open. But in, in my case, I will be using post as opposed to get, which was mentioned in class. That's, this is the first parameter, what method. I could use post, I could use get, I can use put. But for this class, we'll be using mainly post and get. The second parameter is the URL. Lastly, this, uh, this third parameter that is set to true is what makes uh, AJAX asynchronous. If I set this to false, AJAX will become synchronous. And I will go over this later. The next line over specifies what, kind of, what type of, uh, what the content type is that will be sent over. For regular text and for just plain text, you will be using most for the most part application slash uh, x www form URL encoded. But for things like files, you would want to use something like multi part slash uh, form data. Now, for the post request, you need to specify how long uh, the length of the actual parameters to the server. And in this case, uh, we specify this by uh, set setting the request header with this and uh, as a second parameter, putting params.length. The next line imp uh, implies that once the server, once the server has, re has responded, close the connection with the X, X inside the XML HTTP request object. And over to the next line, on ready state change. Uh, I know we mentioned this in class. Uh, what happens here is that each time, each time the server does something in terms of states, it goes through four different states. Each time it does something, it will have uh, on ready dot state change will have a will, uh, will uh, okay. It will send an, a notification to the XML HTTP request object with a uh, with a value. So when it's first being initialized and, and so forth, it will go through four different states, one, two, three, and four. And what I'm specifying here is that each time the server is, is, is shifting from one state to another, go ahead and call the method, this method called getTextHandler, which I define below. I could have put an anonymous function here like f as in function and so forth. But I choose to do it this way because if I wanted to enter a lot of code in, in this function, it would not look so visually, so aesthetically pleasing if I wanted to do so. And that hence why I put it down here. Now mind you, I cannot pass parameters here by opening parentheses and entering something like like uh, variable one and so forth. This will not work. Instead, if you want to, if you choose to uh, send something to, send parameters to this function, what you will need to do is call an anonymous function and then call get text handler inside this and here is where you'll pass the parameter like variable. This is the right way to do this.
lastly, the, the last line here is the part which sends the parameters or sends the information over to the server. And it looks like this, x, uh, xhr.send, and inside is where you specify your parameters to be sent to the server side. Now, I could have alternatively put nothing in here or null. I could have done this or null, which means that I'm not really sending anything to the server. But in this case, I am sending a variable called, where is it? I want text. Okay, on to the callback function, which is called uh, on every on ready, on, on ready state change. Does anyone have any questions so far on this? No? Okay. So this is the handler function that will be called four times by the XML HTTP request object. Well, four times assuming that the server made it that far. And I can, maybe I can demonstrate this a little later, but for, for, for this uh, example, I will first just make a simple AJAX call to the server. Let me show you what AJAX.php looks like. It is a very small file, and I made it as such for simplicity. And it either accepts, well, I've commented this code out, I either accepts a post variable called I want XML or I want text. So what I'm saying here essentially is that I'm looking for a ver post variable called I want text. If it is available, regardless of its value, I want the server to print out text received with value of whatever the value uh, of that variable is. back to ajax.html. Okay, so how do I call this function? How, how do I make this happen? How can I call get text when the page loads? Can anyone tell me? Okay, so when the page loads, there are two methods mainly. Well, they're all, they all point to the basically the same thing. But when the, when the actual page loads, I can use the onload event in the body. I can call it here. I can say get text. Or I can use um, Ajax's, I mean <laughs> jQuery's document.ready function. And I can put dot text, get text here. And I'm able to use jQuery here because I, if you recall earlier, I specified that uh, I called for the script to come from Google. So I have the entire jQuery library of this. Uh, I will have, once this document loads, I will have at this point the entire jQuery library loaded in my DOM. Okay, let's go back to get text. Okay, so it calls for a get text handler. Once the, once the page loads, the body will call get text, and then it will send the information over to ajax.php. And when ajax.php starts changing states, it will call uh, XML HTTP request here, will we'll call the get text handler method, which is this method. And if all is good, if, th if ready state is equal to four, which is the last state that uh, the server is in, and if the status code is 200, which means everything is okay, the page was found, and, uh, and it's delivering the data, then I can go ahead and re alert the text that was uh, submitted back to the browser. So if I go here, if I come here to localhost, section ajax, ajax.html, and I go ahead and refresh the page, what should I see based on this code? Okay, 
me go back a little bit. So I am sending I want text equals to yes to the server. The server is as a post as a post variable. The server is taking this and is printing this value out. And then the handler, which is down here, is going to alert in a text box the response text. So what should I see? What should happen when I load the page? Sorry? An alert? An alert. Oh, yes, an alert. But what, what is inside this alert box? Text received a value, yes. Let's see. Okay, nothing happened. Oh, there you go. Took a long time, considering that it's on the same, in the same folder. But this is what, uh, this is the text that, that is being responded back from the server code. Okay, is everyone clear on this, uh, on this part of the code, this part? Okay, good. Now we're going to move over to another example. I call this one get XML object uh, because, and this time around, everything is pretty much the same except that the parameters, the parameter name is I want XML and I will uh, uncomment that part in the corresponding server side. And the response type is the actual response is, uh, is of XML. So the difference here is that I will be receiving an XML structure. Now let me go back to a ajax.php and I will comment this out and I'll tell you why I'm commenting this out shortly. And I will comment this in. So if post, if it says I want, if the variable is called I want XML, if that's being sent over to me as a server script, I want to send out an XML structure. Okay, where are you? Okay, so here, this should alert the response.xml coming from the server. I mean the dot response XML coming from the server. What should we now, s well, I need to call the function first. So get XML object. I apologize for scrolling down so much. <coughs> get XML object, let me, Remove this one. Okay, what do you expect to happen now when I load the page? And I'll go back up and I will go back up here. Right. What do you expect to see happen when I alert xhr.responseXML? And this is the actual response coming from the server. Sorry, what was that? It will alert the XML in the text box. That's pretty close, but uh, in fact, it will not. And what it will alert, it's gonna get, take some time. It will actually alert that it's, that it's an object, uh, it's an XML ob document object because it is enveloped in an actual object. It is not raw text, it's not plain text. So, which takes us to the next, to our next function called, on this client side, of course, and it is called get XML text. Now, with this uh, iteration, what is essentially happening is that in the response, on the response end, I am taking the response, uh, the XML structure, and I am getting all the tags called text because I've specified under the root node, I've speci specified a bunch of values un uh, enclosed within text uh, labeled tags. So here I am getting all the tags called text and inserting them into this variable. And this variable becomes a, an array holding all these values. 
So let's suppose now I will I alert. I'm going to alert the text the uh, underscore tag underscore values dot length. I will first need to change this to get XML text. Okay, what do you expect to see happen now? when I call this, and I, I know you're not looking at the PHP side, but now that you look, you, you can see here, I have two, ec two text elements, and I am calling for get, uh, to get all the tags that are named text, and inserting them into the variable, into this variable, text underscore, underscore tag underscore values. What should I see? When I when I call for the for the length of this array, how many how many values or if any? Two. Two is the correct answer. There it is. That's two elements. Now, how do I print them out? Let's go ahead and and iterate through this. Um, XML and through this ar array for let's say i equals zero, i less than text tag values dot length i plus plus and alert text tag values i close all right so what should i see now i should actually see the values well i'm seeing again i'm seeing an uh, an element object in order, to, since these are actual objects still stored in, in within the array, the only way to access the text in them is to call the DOM operator of, and then first child dot node value, and this should print out there we go text received with value of, and the output will be an XML another text node. Oh, it should have print, okay, post XML. Okay, before I move on to the next example, which is jQuery, I would like to run through a small example with the Java, the Ajax being Synchronous. Now I'll also go back to the get text method. I'll show you how Ajax can be synchronous. So this is get. Oh no, this is not it. This is get text. And instead of leaving this part set to true, I will set it to false. And at the end of this function, I will call alert finished get text. So let's see what happens when I, well, from the PHP end. Okay, before I comment this out, th I would like to let you know why I commented out this part when I was outputting XML to the, serv to the client side. The reason is, if I did leave this, it would actually be s uh, not interpreted by the client side as XML. So when you, whenever you send out XML, the only thing that can be in this document is an output of XML. Let me go ahead and comment this out. Comment this back in. Okay, 
Okay, now that I've made this synchronous, what do you expect to happen here? So I've, I've changed this from true to false. And I entered a, I inserted a, an alert box at the very end of the statement. You know what? First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to leave this to true, representing the original example. So if I'm going to refresh now, here's what's going to happen. Text value with, uh, text received with value of this is coming from the server. Let me refresh this again. Look, notice what happens. It calls finished get, get, uh, get text, finishing get text first. So it calls this method first, and then it gets a call, and then it calls uh, the other one, which is specified in the callback function. Let me do this one more time. So F5. I don't know if you saw this. The only reason why it's, it, it hasn't really closed, it's still in the background. So when I close this, it's still there. Okay, what do you expect to happen when I change this to false? The order will switch. Yes, the order will switch. What will happen here is this, the, the, the client side JavaScript will wait uh, until the server has completed its, its, uh, its whatever it's processing. And then once it sends the information back and everything is A-OK, -okay, then the JavaScript will complete the remainder of the code. So let me do it at uh, five here again. And here's what happens. I get a text received with value of yes. And if I press OK, then I will get finished getting text. And this is an important, I mean, this is, you might want to use this in places where you rely, you're relying on certain information from the server and you cannot go forward without that information. But like in the instance of, uh, let's say Facebook has a space in, in your page that has a bunch of ads and those ads are being retrieved through Ajax. Now it would not make sense to make the Ajax calls, uh, Ajax to be false. Uh, it would not make sense to make it synchronous because then you'll not be able to see your friends, your the feeds in your Facebook page until the ads have loaded. So in this case, you would want to set, set, keep it as true. But in other cases where you're reliant, where your, your client side code is reliant on pieces of information, then you will probably want to use this. In general, it's not used that much, I mean, in practice. Okay, lastly, This is something, uh, I'm going to go over something David touched on in class at the very, near the very end, which is the usage of jQuery. Now jQuery has uh, conveniently uh, created shorthand methods for, for Ajax calls. One uh, popular one being .ajax. There are other methods too. There's one called .post, which pertains to post, sending post uh, requests to servers. And there's also a third one called that JSON, which uh, is tailored to uh, deal with JSON requests. And in this case, I will mimic what I did basically in this example. I am mimicking what I did with uh, get text, except that uh, everything here is much shorter. So again, the the Ajax function takes in a JSON object as its parameter, which is this. And inside that object is an instruction set. I have an attribute, uh, attri a set of attributes with their values. This is going to be a post operation. And this is the specified URL. The data is the data that will be sent to the server uh, using this function. Now, if I wanted to put more than one variable, here's what I would do. I would say, let's say I want text, uh, yes. And the next, I can put a comma and I say variable, let's say variable two equals to, or variable two, six, which would then, uh, is this is tantamount to I want text equals to yes, ampersand sign, variable two equals to six. 
lastly, in this uh, structure, the attribute success will uh, specify what function to be called in the event of a success uh, operation, successful server operation. In this case, it's an anonymous function, and the, the actual word response here will be replaced by whatever the server outputs back to us. And here I am alerting, in the body of this anonymous function, I'm alerting the response. So let's go here, and what, what's the name of the function? It is called uh, use jQuery. So I'll just call use jQuery here. I'm going to go ahead and refresh the page. And sure, surely enough, it did the ex exact same thing as get text. Does anyone have any questions on this? No? Okay, I will move forward now to Project 2's walkthrough. Here we go. Okay, back to the frenzy. Okay, project two, uh, the specification came out today. And what is project two, what does it entail? So what are we trying to accomplish here? We're trying to build a mashup. Uh, uh, we're calling it a mashup because we're kind of embedding a map from Google's inside uh, a div. So it's not really our, our code that we're using here. It's, it's Google's code that is being displayed or the mark their markup that is being displayed on our page. And, and then, but then again, we have to put in our own code inside that page to manipulate this, this ma map that we're going to be embedding. So we're building a mashup to hook a, to hook a Google map into San Francisco's BART, uh, Bay Area Rapid Transit. And the technologies needed here are uh, MySQL or another caching technology. It could be a CSV file, it could be an set of XML files, so you can store it in a text file through using JSON, for example. I personally prefer MySQL for this, just because uh, BART's API is already, is already designed in a relational fashion, and I like to mimic this or mirror this on my end when I cache it, so that I can later uh, use this in a, uh, if I wanted to extend, for example, my program to do more sophisticated functions where there, wh where joins are involved and so forth, it would be much easier than, than to, say, use a, uh, an XML file or a CSV file. The next technology that is needed is HTML, obviously, to embed the Google map inside this. Uh, JavaScript will be needed for, uh, to communicate with this Google map. You will need JavaScript. Uh, you will download, w once you include the JavaScript, uh, Google Maps API uh, JavaScript code uh, in your script tags, it will download all of that code to your page, to your DOM, and will make the function, functions available for you to use. And you will also need JavaScript to utilize Ajax, naturally. Lastly, you will probably need to use PHP to, to avoid the or same, same uh, origin policy. And to store the cached content to your server and to also load the, con uh, the cached content from your server. Okay, so what is the end product? What are we looking for here? The end product for this project is one HTML page that embeds a Google map. So you'll see a big page with a, with a map inside it. And under that map, or somewhere around that map, there are, will be HTML controls, such as a drop-down menu, option boxes, et cetera. And these controls will be used to switch view, uh, route views. So each time you select a different route, you, we, we should be able to see a new, new route uh, laid out on the map, uh, but one at a time. So we, cannot, we, we should not be able to see uh, more than one route at a time. And each route will appear as a polyline, which is a set of connected lines. So it will be like 
it will be going in different directions at points. Each station, each station um, that is represented on this line, on this polyline, so a route will naturally co be composed of stations, and each station should appear as a marker on the map, a Google Maps marker. Upon clicking on the marker, uh, the user will see real-time arrival slash departure information for the station at hand uh, in an info window. Now, all these terms m might not be familiar to you right now, but when you go in and do a little bit of research in the Google Maps JavaScript API version 3, you will see what this all means. Okay, the sequence in building this. How do we build this? What are the steps? The first step is for you to embed a centered a, a Google Map in an HTML page and make it centered to uh, San Francisco. The second step, which is not really a technical step, is to confirm that you understand our, and are able to use markers, info windows, and polylines from the Google Maps AVI, API version 3. Uh, once you're, you feel comfortable with these concepts and how to use them in a Google's Maps, then you can move forward to the next step. The next step is also a conceptual one. You will need to identify what data you will need from BART's real API. Uh, so what data will, will you need to get uh, locally in order to accomplish a polyline and with a bunch of markers? What data would you need? Would you need the address? Would you need the latitude, uh, longitude coordinates? Uh, this will be determined by the actual objects you will be using in, Go in Google Maps. So by looking at what uh, inputs the polylines would need and the markers, you will be able to determine uh, what information you will need to get from BART. The third step is after you've identified what data you need, you actually need to get the data. Now there are several ways of doing this. You can actually go in and copy the data locally in the, in the CSV file or in a MySQL database. Or you can create your own script, your own PHP script that will do this automatically for you. And the next step would be to build the HTML controls outside of the Google Map, inside that HTML page that you, you will develop. And uh, each time those, you will play around with those controls, and each time it, those controls change, they should trigger some sort of call to the server side and have the server um, output back the necessary information to accomplish a polyline along with the markers. Lastly, after, the, after you're able to get this far and you have a polyline out with the, with, its, with the markers laid out, what you need to do next is have the markers become interactive so that once you click on the marker for each station, uh, an info window will pop up. An info window looks like a little uh, balloon. Uh, with the so it should pop up with information coming in real time from Bart's Real API over the internet. So this is not the information that is coming through to, uh, into the info window is real-time information as opposed to the cache information that is coming into the polylines and the markers. Uh, so once you click on the, an, a certain marker, it should somehow send to the Bart's Real, uh, Bart's Real API what station it needs the information from. What, what, and then the Bart's API will send back that information you will take that information using AJAX and output it inside that info window. Now, the nice thing about info windows is that they can support HTML. So you can, you can make it look uh, nice. Okay, sample time. Now I will go ahead and touch on the different uh, technologies needed to accomplish this. The rest will be up to you. I have created a very simple page called index.html. And so it starts off, uh, it starts off as an HTML5 document. Uh, it is not scalable. We are making it, uh, we are making it stay the same regardless of how we resize the window. And I would apply this 
these style rules as I, I got them from the example set in um, Google Maps JavaScript API version 3. And down here is my own rule for a div, which will uh, pertain to a select box. OK, so if you go to Google Maps API, it's a very comprehensive, uh, has a lot, it has comprehensive documentation on pretty much everything that it supports. And getting started, clicking on, if you go into navigating to developers.google.com forward slash maps, forward slash documentation is a very good step for you to take. Uh, first thing you want to do is get, click on getting started and experiment a, a little bit uh, with, with, the main, with the main features. I don't, think you will need an, I don't think you will need an API key for this. And on the left side here, you can see that you can click on the uh, different aspects of this API. Overlays will, uh, will include markers, polylines, and info windows, which are three things that you will need to be using in this project. I don't think you'll need to touch on the other things in this. All right, so let's go ahead and do something. Again, I borrowed this code from their API, from their example, so it should be hopefully as easy for you to do as well. First, I'm going to define a variable called map in which I will sto store the Google map ob object. And I will come back to the marker later. And I will create a function called initialize, which just sets a, sets a map uh, centered around San Francisco in my HTML page. Let me go through this function real quick. I first define the map options in a JSON format, JSON object. And this specifies, uh, this, is, this sort, of, sort of acts like a constructor for the map object from Google. From Google. Here, what I'm, what I'm uh, specifying is that the map be centered to the for following latitude longi longitude coordinates. And this is done through calling, by calling a new uh, google.maps.latlng object. With these, with these variables. So essentially, this is uh, the center here, this whole thing, is looking for an object of uh, lat LNG and not just an actual set of numbers. Zoom will pertain to the level of uh, zoom that we're going to be zooming into the map uh, when we first load it. The map type specifies what type of map we're going to see. Uh, Right now, we're going to see a graphical map uh, as opposed to a real, uh, real aerial view. But you can change this here. So now that I have my options ready to go, I can create a new map. So I, I will set this map variable to contain a new Google Maps.map object. And I will want this map to go into a div inside my page. Uh, the convention is to use a name like map underscore canvas. You can use any name you like. What this essentially does is inserts the Google map inside this div element. And comma, and it will apply the, the second parameter here is, we're, is that we're applying the map options to this newly created map. So it will be centered, it will be zoomed to 12, and it will use the, utilize this kind of, uh, this type of map. And I could have done without the, the options, but this is part of your requirement to be zoomed in. I mean, to be uh, centered to San Francisco. Let me show you where I define map canvas. Look down at the very bottom. It is simply a div inside the body right here, and it's called 
map canvas. That's all it is. That's all there is to it. You define a div, I a div with an ID of whatever you specify, and then you call in the in the initialize function, you create a new map object specifying that the new map object will go inside this map that uh, map uh, in this div. I will go ahead and call the initialize function inside the onload. So what I should, should see happen here is, well right now my page is, is blank, not this one. Let me load this. Okay, so as, as you can see, I now have a map that is centered um, on San Francisco. It, it does not appear to be as such right now on the projector, but it is in fact centered there. The next step uh, that I would like to do is to create a, a polyline. A polyline is a set of, as a path of different, um, as a path that is, th that, is comp that is created by following different points on the map. And in order to accomplish this, I have to first define an array of different points on the map. And I do this by defining an array that contains polyline, uh, po by, by, uh, by defining an array that contains lat LNG objects. So what I've done here is I've created a variable called po polyline coordinates. And inside it, I have defined three different lat LNG objects in that order. So when I form the polyline, it will first look for it at this point, it will connect it with this point, and it will connect it to that point. So depending on the order, the order of these three will make a difference. Just remember that. Next, I will define a variable called polyline path, and this is the, the actual polyline itself, the polyline object. I do this by creating a new google.maps.polyline object constructor. And the first attribute that I specify here is path. And path will point to an array of lat LNG objects. In our case, it is called polyline coordinates, which I've defined up here. So this is the, f the main, this is the heart of the polyline, the actual path. Now these other attributes, I think you can leave them out. Stroke color refers to the color of, of that line. And I've specified it to be here, FF000, which is red. Stroke opacity is how opaque the line will be. I, th I think this value ranges from zero to one. And stroke weight is how bold the line will be, how thick it will be. Once I've done all this, once I've completed this, I need to lay it out on the actual map. And this is how I do this. I call the set map function on the polyline path object, on the polyline uh, object. And I specify in parentheses what map I want this to go on. So let me go ahead and actually call this function. After initialize, I'm going to call add polyline. Let's see what happens. This is the wrong file. Okay, I'm going to do an F5 here. And as you can see, there's a newly formed red line going from San Francisco to somewhere. I randomly chose these points because they were visually there on the map. But this is an actual very simplistic polyline, a minimal polyline, let's say, because it's only two lines. What if it were one, it would just be a line. So the way we, would, we uh, hope to see the, the routes, the, 
the BART routes on the map is through polylines. So we want to see, let's say, that, um, if you look at any metro map, you'll see a bunch of li lines uh, denoted in different colors. So this is a very simplistic example, but once, let's say I have a, a set of controls here, like a select box or something, I can select a certain route and it will display the route here. Now the information, the actual array that will, the actual coordinates will come from the cache that you have already created on your, on your end. Okay, next up is I would like to create a marker. And I'd like to show you what a marker looks like in Google Maps. This is a, also a very uh, simple thing to do. Uh, you specify a variable and you call the new google.maps.marker uh, object constructor. And this will take a value, a JSON object inside. It specifies uh, one of the attributes is position, so you need to know where this will go. Again, position will take uh, a lat LNG object as its, uh, as its value. And next is the title. The title, um, I don't think is necessary, but this is what will appear once you hover over the marker. And I'm sure there are more attributes to this. Oh, lastly, to, uh, you will use the same fashion to display this on the map. You will call the set map method on the marker object, and you will specify what map it should correspond to. In this case, it's map, because I have already defined that map up here. Where is it? This is the global variable map to this page. I have defined it and initialized to hold a map object. This is just a recap. So I will call now add marker, and these are the coordinates of San Francisco. Add marker. Let me go ahead and refresh this page. And I do, in fact, see a marker here. And if I hover, hover over it, it should say I am a marker, which is what I gave it for a title. Now, if I click here, nothing happens. Uh, so if this were to be your project, you would get downgraded because what, what, what needs to happen here is uh, as soon as I click on the station, an info window should pop up specifying uh, the real-time arrival and departure, uh, yes, the real-time arrival and departure times. On to the last thing, which is info window. I've created a function called add info window. Info window is also an object in google.maps, in the google.maps, uh, Google JavaScript API library. And this is how you typically create one. Again, a variable. And you create an info window object. And these are the parameters it needs. Content, what is it going to say? Here I can put HTML, I'll show you a little later <coughs> what I can do with this. And uh, the position of it, sorry, excuse me. <coughs> so the position will take a lat LNG object. And I'm going to remove this code. Unlike the polyline and like the polyline and the marker, info window is displayed in a different way. You actually have to say info call the info window object and then call a dot open method. Now notice I've specified where it's going to appear on the, on the page, on the map. I don't know what, what these coordinates stand for. I mean where where they point to, but let's find out. So we'll do add info window. And I click on F5. Hmm. Let's see what I did wrong here. All right. Okay. 
So it calls the win open method, but we didn't specify. We didn't specify what map it's going to open on. So we have to put this inside. Okay, I'm going to press F5 now. And I should see, it still didn't work. Info window open. Hmm. Let me just try one thing here. console, see if there are any errors. No errors. Let's look at the documentation just to confirm. So this is what uh, you would do if you were at home and trying to make this work. You would first look at this documentation online. So info window dot open map marker. What should happen is the first time around, when I call info window dot open and then put m put the map parameter in. Okay, you know what? <laughs> Here's what I did wrong. I did not call the actual method. Add info window because everything else looked correct. A nice waste of time. Mm. Okay, so what happens now is I see an info window with a nice shadow over this area come up. Now, what if I wanted to connect this to the marker? Notice how I gave the the marker has a different set of latitude uh, longitude coordinates than does the info window. But what if I want to put this on top of that exactly? Now here's what I can do. Here is where I can put this code. I can add an event listener to the marker uh, such that when you click on the marker, it will call an anonymous function. And then the info window will open on the map and at the specified marker. Now, where is marker defined? And this is where, uh, this is why I needed to actually create the marker va variable on top. So because when, once I created the marker and add marker, had I, not created, had I not defined it on top, it would not have been accessible to the add info window function. But now that I've created it here, I mean on top, and defined it in add marker, it is available for the rest of the functions to use. And my info window should now Okay, one thing to note here is that the, the default coordinates for the info window is th this. Once you add it to a marker, the latitude and longitude coordinates will override the default coordinates for that info window. So this whole thing will no longer apply. Okay, let's test it out. F5. Okay, there's no info window, it disappeared. If I hover over, I'm a marker. If I click on this, there's the info window. And this is where the real time arrival uh, and departure time should appear for the different trains coming and going from this station. 
Remember that this is H this can support HTML, so I could I can put something like h1 style equals color blue and close this. Thank you, Genie. Okay. That's it. If I refresh this without closing. And I click on the info uh, on the marker. I should see this in, in blue and an H1 font. Okay. Okay. Any questions? This pretty much covers. I think it touches on the most important aspects of, of project two. Any questions at all? Is everything really clear? Yes. Oh, yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, what was the oh, the question. Can you explain uh, the ca the mechanism of the cache and how it will work? So uh, the cache, the Bart, the their API has a set of. Um, uh, let me show you what what it looks like. So if you look at BART's documentation, their API, if I click on, for example, route information, okay, and if I click on routes, it will respond back with an XML structure of, of their routes and so forth. And down here is a sample of what you will get back as a response uh, from, this, from their servers. Okay, so you will need to take this information from BART's real API whatever they're sending back. Now, there, notice that there are so many different pieces of information here. You will need to take the information, parse out the information that you need, and save it locally in some logical structure. OK? So what kind of imp information do you think you would need from BART? There are so many things that you can get from there. You can get real-time estimates. You can get route info, advisories, and so forth. What the answer to this is you will need to get just enough, enough information to accomplish the polylines and the markers. And in fact, there is a, a way we can test this out here. Let me see if I can find it. There is a place on the left side that says examples or... You can actually click on this. Maybe under overview. Right information. Examples. There we go. So examples. Let's click on. There we go. You see this? This is what I'm getting back for from their API. And you will need to do such a thing uh, in, in two phase in two two parts of this project. The first part is when you get the information to cache. The second part is where you will be asking it to, uh, asking for the real-time arrivals and departures information. And there are two ways to, actual, to, to get the real-time arrivals and departures. There's a simple ETA feed. Uh, it's somewhere on their site. And there's also the, you can use the real BART API to get the real-time, uh, those figures. I don't know if I've answer, answered your question, but did, did it, did the cache make sense, or do you want me to go to more detail? Do you, want, do you want me to go into more detail on how to store the cache or how to, how to store the information? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're making a call to, to, the API, to the real BART API first, right? You're getting the information that you need for, to, um, you're getting all the information about the routes, their locations, their, their, all the stations, their locations, the different routes, and so forth. And this will be up to you to decide how to put everything conceptually on your end. Now, locally, when you, what you do is you, you make the call. You can actually you can take the values and copy them and paste them, but that's, that's a lot of work. Or you can create a script, uh, a PHP script, that will go out and pull all this information locally. You can store it in an XML file. You can store it in a JSON, a CSV file, and so forth. I recommend that you use a MySQL database 
to store it locally uh, because it will it's as I mentioned earlier it will have it has their API already has a relational structure so it's much easier to manipulate later so you'll store it in a bunch of let's say tables or uh, files and so forth then you will you will store it in a way that you understand and that you are able to extract from later to uh, accomplish the polylines and the markers. Yes, the depart. Uh, so the question is, uh, this, uh, the suggestion was that they keep changing. The, the, the departure and arrival times keep changing. Yes, those those will be called in real time. So when you click on that marker, a real time request, a request, let's say a post or a get, will will go to the server, to, to their server, and it will receive the XML uh, response, and then you will parse the XML response, and we'll throw it into the info wi window before it's being displayed. Does that make sense? Yeah. But in, in doing so in, in this, and for this part, there are two ways to do it. There are two, uh, BART has two, two ways to feed you this information. One is the, through their real BART API, Another one is called a simple, simple ETA feeds. You can look, look for that online. I personally use the real BART a API. Any other questions? Is everything pretty much clear? Yes? Has it been over an hour? Yes, sorry. Okay, then uh, I guess we can conclude this session. Uh, I hope I touched on them the important parts of Ajax and the walkthrough, uh, the walkthrough for Project 2. If you have any questions, feel free to use the uh, discussion board. And after class, uh, Chris Gerber will be uh, handling on-campus office hours. And at 9 p.m., I will be holding a session for, uh, an online office, for online office hours on TeamViewer. And the information is provided to you on the course's website under the Google Calendar. There's the TeamViewer ID and uh, so forth, everything that you need to connect to that. So thank you everyone and uh, good luck on project uh, one, both projects one and two. Let us know if you have any questions. <laughs> the, clap, the claps always make me laugh. Yeah. <laughs>